Welcome to Redefining Medicine, an intimate and personalized program that illustrates a different side of the practice of medicine. Our in-depth conversations will focus on the physicians and practitioners who are redefining medicine through their integrative, functional, and holistic approach to health and well-being. We are pleased to welcome Dr. Tom O'Brien, a world-renowned expert in the field of gluten-related disorders and their link to other chronic conditions. Welcome. Thank you so much. You have emerged as an internationally recognized expert regarding gluten-related disorders and their relationship to other chronic conditions. Will you share a bit about how you were first drawn to this issue? Ah, well we have to go back to 1979 when my ex and I could not get pregnant. And I was an intern at the time and I called the seven most famous holistic doctors of the day and I was able to reach each of them on the phone and ask, what do you do for infertility? And they all told me what they do and I put a program together. We were pregnant in six weeks. My neighbors in married housing asked if I'd work with them. She had been through artificial insemination and nothing had worked. And I, uh, I said, well, um, I don't think it'll hurt you. So sure, she was pregnant in three months. So we were hot to trot before I got out and practiced to help every couple get pregnant that was having problems and we helped hundreds and hundreds over the years. And there's not much in medicine that's all or every, but this was an every. Clinically, this was an every. Every person, male or female, that had hormone-related imbalances, whether it was premature ejaculations, unexplained miscarriages, infertility, premenstrual syndromes, it didn't matter. Any hormone-related imbalance Every person was eating foods that they didn't know were a problem for them, they didn't know, that were causing inflammation somewhere in the body, contributing to the symptoms they were having. And as I dialed that down, consistently, there were two that are at the top of the list, and that's wheat and dairy. So I started reading more of the research on these. I'd read a paper, and my jaw would drop reading this paper, about uh, 10 patients work comp for an average of eight years meaning they hadn't worked for eight years because of severe migraines, 10. And they put them all on a gluten-free diet. None of them were celiacs. They put them all on a gluten-free diet. Seven out of 10 never had a headache again. Two out of 10 got partial relief and the 10th one refused the diet. So your jaw drops when you see studies like that. So I read the references, I ordered the references in the back of that study and read more about this and then read more and then read more and now I literally over the years, I've read thousands of articles about wheat-related disorders, gluten sensitivity, celiac disease, and I've learned that it's a critical component to look for whenever a patient is not getting the results that you think they should be getting. As a demonstration, when I'm on stage, I'll say, how many people, how many docs know or suspect you may have a sensitivity to wheat? Show of hands, please. Come on, hold them up, because they do this. Hold your hands high and they hold them high, look around the room, and people go, like this, holy cow, it's like 80% of the room. And this is not a talk to celiacs, where everyone is interested for this topic. This is healthcare professionals that just are a little more sensitive to what's going on in their body. And then I'll say, now watch this. How many of you know or suspect that if you have an inadvertent exposure to wheat, it seems to affect your brain? Come on and about 70% of that first 80% raise their hand. Now say, look around the room. The brain is the most common system of the body impacted by a gluten-related disorder. It's the brain, it's not the gut. And the studies show that only one out of eight will have gut symptoms with a wheat-related disorder. One out of eight. So if, Doc, if you're looking for people to say, I feel bad when I eat wheat, I get bloating, I get gas, you'll catch it one out of eight times because it might be joint pain or it might be cardiomyopathy or it might be tinnitus or it might be brain fog, that it depends on your genetics and the antecedents of how you lived your life as to where the weak link is in your chain. You pull at a chain, it always breaks at the weakest link, always. It's at one end, the middle, the other end. It's your heart, your brain, your liver, your kidneys. Wherever your genetic weak link is, that's where the chain's going to break. So the first rule of thumb for any symptom that a patient comes in with across the board, stop pulling on the chain so hard. 
Well, what does that mean? It means, well, we all know that degenerative diseases are inflammatory. So the question is, is it gasoline or kerosene? Is it the brain or the kidney cell? What is it that's causing the inflammation? And we get caught looking for the therapeutic protocols. What's the mo most effective, most well-absorbed coenzyme Q10? That's a critical question for people on statins, you know, or what diet is the best? Critical question. But is it gasoline or kerosene that we have to take a step back? And what docs find unmistakably all the time in their practice, just like when I ask them to raise their hand, seven, eight out of 10 people, if you do the right tests, seven to eight out of 10 people will demonstrate that your immune system is saying, you got a problem with wheat whether you feel it in your gut or not. So the concept of an elimination diet, where you eliminate foods and then you reintroduce them back in one at a time to see what causes problems, not relevant in when you're looking for food-related disorders because you're depending on a GI response. You're depending on the gut saying, I got a problem with this food. So the ratio is one out of eight. You have to look to the immune system because your immune system is the armed forces in your body. You know, it's the Army, the Air Force, the Marines, the Coast Guard, the Navy, IGA, IgG, IgE, IgM. They're all branches of the armed forces designed to protect you. It's not an immune system going crazy when it's activated and you have an autoimmune disease. It's an immune system trying to protect you from something. And the collateral damage is you develop Hashimoto's or you develop rheumatoid or you develop psoriasis. So you don't treat the psoriasis. Oh, well, of course, you want to help patients feel better, but you have to treat where's the gasoline coming from? And the immune system is the system of the body that can be your uh, roadmap as to where to look, where to begin to help this patient with a chronic condition get a handle on it. So if, if, it's, if it's not the elimination diet, then, and, and it's Now the, that's beneficial. The elimination diet is beneficial, absolutely. But you can't determine reintroduction by how they feel. Right. It doesn't matter how they feel. Of course, if they get symptoms, you know right away, but that's only one out of eight, right? Right, right. So you, you, you do the elimination, for, so you check the immune system first, and then you do an elimination diet if you want, and then, but you have to wait two to four months, and then you recheck the immune system because the antibodies have a lifespan of six weeks to three months, four months, so you can't recheck too soon or you might not get an accurate response. How are you checking the immune system? Oh, let's talk about testing. <laughs> you know, uh, we'll use wheat as the example that uh, every laboratory looks for, they call it gluten, some of them do, the gluten test. And it's actually looking at one peptide of poorly digested wheat called alpha gliadin it's a 33 amino acid peptide, 50% of celiacs will have elevated antibodies to alpha gliadin But wait a minute, we know that wheat is the trigger for celiac disease, but only 50% come back positive on the test. What does that mean? It means it's not a comprehensive test. We now know, the studies are really clear, there's 62 peptides of poorly digested wheat that have been identified as immunogenic, stimulating an immune response. So the obvious question for a clinician is, why are we only checking one? And that test, alpha gliadin came out in 1996. Now in 1998, Umberto Volta, the chair at the time of the Celiac Society of Italy, came out with a new test called deamidated gliadins. And that makes us a little more sensitive. So that's another uh, peptide of poorly digested wheat. But that was 1998. Now, many of our laboratories are offering gliadin and deamidated gliadin as the go-to test for celiac disease, or they'll include transglutaminase, which is a great test, but that came out in 1997. So we're talking about tests that are 20 years old, and the studies are very clear. If you have celiac disease with total villus atrophy, the shags are worn down completely, the transglutaminase test is 97 to 100% sensitive and specific. But that's the end stage of celiac disease when the shags have worn down, the villi have worn down completely. The earlier stages, when you're on the celiac spectrum, getting the damage, when you check transglutaminase in subtotal villus atrophy, the test is sensitive 27 to 32% of the time. It means it comes back wrong seven out of 10 times. 
So when you do the current blood tests that the laboratories are recommending, if you have total villus atrophy, the test is right on the money. But if you have partial villus atrophy, or you have the inflammation in the gut, which is causing the slow wearing down of those microvilli, and that's the most dangerous uh, for fatalities, is the inflammation, it's wrong seven out of 10 times. Because the tests are 20 years old, and our laboratories are not upping their game. Excuse me, but nobody's talking about this uh, point blank. And these are pe people's lives that we're talking about here. So laboratories came out, um, there was a lab that came out in 2010, Cyrex Laboratories, and they looked at 10 different peptides of poorly digested wheat, not one. Much more sensitive, much more specific. And it launched a whole new world of thinking. When I would talk about these studies on stage, I say this study and this study and this study, and now we have a test that's looking at 10. So doctors were finding many more cases that previously they would have missed. Then in 2016, Mayo Clinic published a paper in January of 2016, Joe Murray at Mayo, who's what I call one of the four horsemen. There are four horsemen in celiac disease, that's my term for it. These are the guys that have been around for 25, 30 years, published many, many studies. There's Peter Green at Columbia, Stefano Guandolini, University of Chicago, uh, Joe Murray at Mayo, and Alessio Fasano at Harvard. Now, Joe Murray at Mayo, he's a guy with leather patches on the elbows of his sport coat, bow ties, horn rim glasses, and his papers are the most readable for the clinician. And just pure science, but how it applies in clinics. His team published a paper in January 16 about, and they called it a new era in laboratory medicine, silicon chip technology. And they said it was 97 to 99% sensitive, 98 to 100% specific. And it looks at 26 peptides of poorly digested wheat. And it identifies the earlier stages of the celiac spectrum or a gluten-related disorder spectrum, not just total villus atrophy. So we have testing available now. It's called the wheat zoomer because you zoom in on the problem. We have testing available now that is sent, and the silicone chip technology, they can look at 6,000 antigens in one blood draw. It's a whole new era in laboratory medicine. And there have been, I'm aware of, six papers published now in the last few years on silicone chip technology. Peter Green at Columbia has published on this now. Murray's team has published three or four papers on this now. So um, the credibility is beyond question now that you know, the top guys in the field are saying, hey, this testing is more sensitive and specific than anything we've ever used before. Holy cow. And when you use that type of testing, you don't miss them anymore. And how many people come back positive? In our practice, eight or nine out of 10 will come back positive. Just like when I asked docs in the room, how many of you know or suspect you have a sensitivity to wheat? Now we have testing that identifies it at that level of sensitivity and specificity. Now you can test them. Then you apply your protocols, elimination diet, whatever nutrients you're gonna to do to rebuild a healthy microbiome and uh, uh, reduce the inflammation in your gut. And then you go back and check three months later, four months later with the wheat zoomer again. You have to confirm. It doesn't matter that they feel better. It doesn't matter that their rheumatoid is in remission because no patient has just one autoimmune mechanism going on. They've got multiple. One may be the trait, or one may be the one that's obvious and they complain about those symptoms, but so many of them, there's another test by the same lab called the NeuroZoomer Plus. Looks at 48 different markers of brain inflammation, 48. And we've only had two come back negative now in two and a half years. Everybody has inflammation in the brain. Everyone. Now, what's the significance of that? The brain is the yellow canary in the coal mine. And most people know yellow canaries were used by coal miners a um, hundred years ago. They take a canary in a birdcage down in the coal mine and they check it every once in a while. The canary fell down dead, they get out really quick because methane gas is leaking and humans can't smell it quickly. But the canaries, it kills them, right? The yellow canary in the coal mine. How does that relate to our healthcare issues? The Center for Disease Control came out just a few months ago and said one child in 40 is now in the autism spectrum. 
The Alzheimer's Association came out this year and said one elder in three, that means over 60 years old, dies of dementia or Alzheimer's. One in three. That means in this room, there are two of us in the room, it's the guy that's not here that may go down, right? But the brain's the yellow canary in the coal mine, and no one is looking for this. Everyone's trying to say, take N-acetylcysteine for better brain function, take this for better brain function, take this, and you, you can throw gasoline on the fire in a sense and rev somebody up so their brain functions better, but what's causing the degeneration? You have to go back and identify what's the trigger that's killing off the brain cells. That's the neural zoomer plus with 97 to 99% sensitivity, 98 to 100% specificity. You gotta do the test if you don't wanna go down the path of your family members and your, your relatives with brain deterioration. If you've got that history, you gotta do this test and it's gonna scare the hell out of you because it's gonna come back positive. But that's the wake up call to investigate what do you do, right? You're not gonna look and figure out where the inflammation is coming from if you don't have a biomarker that the inflammation is going on. So you have to check. Do you think that going back a couple of generations, were we suffering from this previously oh, and no. just went undiagnosed? No. Why do you think we're suffering from it today? Absolutely a, not. Um, and in my presentation today, I'll show the slides where the uh, uh, NIH uh, put a slide out, uh, a, a graph that shows state by state what percent increase in Alzheimer's in the next seven years? This was from 2018 to 2025. And the lowest percentage was 19% increase in the next seven, eight years. The highest is 48%. And so we're, we're just going like, the, the brain is the yellow canary in the coal mine. So when you ask, why is this happening? That's a whole discussion, which I'm happy to do, to give you, like, put your toe in the water. Arguably, the most well-respected journal in the English language for children's health is the journal Pediatrics. It comes out from the American Academy of Pediatrics. Well, there was a policy statement published in Pediatrics. Now, you have to understand what that means. If you get a paper published in Pediatrics, you scored. I mean, top-tier journal. Someday I hope to be able to have something accepted by that journal. Uh, but when there's a policy statement, from pediatrics, this is the board that has agreed this message has got to get out to everyone. So this is the board of the American Academy of Pediatrics with a policy statement. What did they say? They said that the Toxic Substance Control Act of 1976 failed miserably to protect our children. It is still the regulating guidelines for the federal government in what chemicals are allowed into um, our society, into our communities. It is the guidelines. Why is it the guidelines? Because the lobbyists at that time were so successful in bribing the senators and representatives to pass this legislation that has no teeth, no teeth whatsoever. An example, according to the policy statement, in the last 30 years, that the TSCA Act, the guiding act at the federal level for new chemicals introduced in our, into our environment, has restricted five chemicals, or classes of chemicals, five, in 30 years. That's it. So, and it's still the guiding, uh, people, no, that can't be true. Look, check it up. Just read for yourself. Google it. Toxic Substance Control Act, you'll see. And what does that mean? In that policy statement, they told us how many trillion, it was 27 point something trillion pounds of chemicals are introduced or into the United States or manufactured every year. Break that down to 350 some million people. That comes out to 247 pounds per person per day. Think about that number. Five 50 pound bags of toxic chemicals per person per day are being introduced into our environment. Every day, 24 seven every day, and it did not include pharmaceuticals or petroleum products. 247 pounds, so there's two of us in this room right now. That's 500 pounds a day. That's 10 50-pound bags every day. What's the impact of that? 
Every doc who's watching this has heard before, every newborn child in America has at least 200 chemicals in their bloodstream at birth that aren't supposed to be there. Many of them are neurotoxins. Here's an example, a paper in 2014, 346, was it? I think it was 346 women, it may have been 386, I'm sorry, I'm not quite sure. Pregnant women in Chicago, eighth month of pregnancy, they collected their urine. They measured five phthalates in the urine. Phthalates are chemicals used to mold plastic. And one of them, the most common one that we've heard about is bisphenol A or BPA. And we hear about BPA-free bottles now to drink your water. Well, they're using BPS, which is more toxic. Uh, so it's the same game, but five chemicals. They took the results for these 346 women. They categorized them into quartiles, the lowest amount of phthalates in the urine, the next, the third, and the highest quartile. They followed the offspring of these pregnant women for seven years. When the children turned seven years old, they did Wexler IQ tests on them, the go-to IQ test. What'd they find? There's not much in medicine that's all or every, but here's another one that's in every. Every child that was in the highest quartile of, of phthalates in pregnancy for mom, those offspring, compared to the children in the lowest quartile, the children in the highest quartile, their IQ was seven points lower than the children in the lowest quartile of phthalates. Seven points, 6.7 to 7.4. When you read this study, you go, what? Now, that doesn't mean anything to most docs until you realize a one point difference in IQ is noticeable. A seven point difference in IQ is a child working really hard getting straight A's and a child working really hard getting straight C's. They don't have the neural network. Why? Read the studies, phthalates inhibit neurogenesis. Mom has high phthalates in her urine, in her bloodstream, in her body during pregnancy, inhibiting neurogenesis, that's brain development. The children of those moms in the highest quartile seven years later, their brains function is seven points lower IQ. That's just five phthalates. And there's 247 pounds per person per day. Remember, the brain is the yellow canary in the coal mine. Alzheimer's, autism, attention deficit, the world is hearing, we're not hearing the screams that are coming from the brain right now. We're thinking about what's the most effective form of CoQ10? You know, or well, I do paleo and I've got a buff body. I look like um, I'm Adonis, you know, or I'm a babe, right? Which is great, there's nothing wrong with that. I don't mean to mock that, but it's secondary to, uh, We've heard about the microbiome and how important the microbiome is. We've heard all of that, and most of us are putting some attention with our patients on it. Great. Take this one. Four years ago, almost four years ago, the World Health Organization, do you think that's a credible group, the World Health Organization? They published an alert that there were 60 growing cycles left in the soil on the planet. 60 growing cycles, why? because the glyphosates and the other chemicals are killing the microbiome of the soil. And the soil is turning into dirt. Dirt has no life. You can't grow plants in dirt. You grow plants in soil. But we're killing the microbiome of the soil. And we have 60 cycles left, that was the estimate. Well, what does that mean? It means that there's gonna be no food in 57 years. No food. Well, that's exaggeration, really? Are you qualified? Have you read the studies to make that kind of a comment? Really? Really? Think about your children or your grandchildren. You know, I've got a three-year-old and I have a four, eight-week-old grandson now and a three-year-old granddaughter. What are they going to do when they're my age? Unless we wake up and those chemicals are killing the microbiome of the soil, they're killing the microbiome of us, they're killing the microbiome that contributes to neurogenesis in the brains of our children. You want to know where this is coming? This is exactly where it's coming from. Every healthcare practitioner needs to become familiar and intimately familiar with guiding your patients on detoxing, not just for three days or one week or a month, and then you go back to the old lifestyle. We have to educate our patients on how to live a cleaner life. We're sitting in this room at this uh, lovely hotel for this conference that's here, 
The formaldehydes in the ceiling tiles are outgassing into, now there's no evidence that the amount of formaldehyde leaching out of the ceiling tiles is toxic to humans. That's true. The carpet is outgassing these flame retardant chemicals. Now there's no evidence that the amount of flame retardant chemicals outgassing from the carpet is toxic to humans. That's true. That's the result of the Toxic Substance Control Act, that there's no evidence that the minor amount of outgassing is toxic to humans. There's no evidence. But this stuff accumulates in your body. Give me 30 years now of phthalates accumulating in a woman's body. Here comes the baby that can't develop a healthy brain because of the levels that have accumulated in the last 30 years. That's how they got away with this crap. There's no evidence that the amount that's outgassing, that's how they get away with this, right? And the safe level of pollution in the air. There is no safe level of pollution in the air. It, the only warnings come when it's so bad you can't breathe without getting symptoms. But what's accumulating in our lungs? We all know about smoking and the tar and the nicotine accumulate, and we've seen pictures of the lungs of people that smoke for 30 years, but we don't carry that same concept into the air we're breathing in these artificial rooms that we're in. The, the uh, uh, chemicals in dry cleaning, the nail polish, the phthalates and nail polish are in your bloodstream in three to five minutes. Just read the studies. Well, there's no evidence the amount of phthalates that leach out of nail polish into your bloodstream in three to five minutes is toxic to humans. It's true, but it accumulates in the body. Nobody's thinking about this. We're living for the day, you know, and we, we, if we can boost up performance, if we can take some supplements, if we can change our diets to boost up performance and feel better, we think that we've won the war. Really? I'll, we'll, we'll, we'll see who gets Alzheimer's first. Just do the Neural Zoomer Plus. Just look at the test results and see if your brain's on fire. If it's not, I'll eat my words. I happily eat, but that's where it's coming from. Wow. So that's uh, a bit of a dystopian view and very realistic. Is there anything that, that we could leave our audience with that, that might be uh, on a more positive note? Well, I'm sorry to say this, but wake the hell up, all of us. People come to you to get well, and you've heard this. You've heard bits and pieces of this. You don't know what to do about it, so you don't do anything. Wake up. Everyone, wake up. How do you do that? My most recent book is called You Can Fix Your Brain. Just one hour a week to the best memory, productivity, and sleep you've ever had. When it came out, it hit number one in seven categories on Amazon for brain function. And I just got a message a couple days ago. It's number one book in the largest bookstore chain in Korea right now, it's in seven languages. But when you read the book, I just lay it out step by step, and what do you do about this? What we have to do, and we have to do it for ourselves first, is do the test and see, do I have this info? First, read the science about the test to confirm that you embrace, yeah, this is an accurate technology, okay. And then do the test, and when you see you've got antibodies to your brain, elevated antibodies, by definition, elevated antibodies means killing off brain cells. There's a normal level of brain cells, a normal level of antibodies we have. Why do you have a normal level of antibodies to your thyroid and to your adrenals and to your muscles and your joints? Why do you have a normal level of antibodies? Mrs. Patient, you have an entire new body every seven years. Every cell in your body regenerates. Some cells are really quick, like the inside lining of the guts every two, three, four days, depending on what study you read. Some cells are very slow, like bone cells are slow, brain cells, but every cell regenerates. So what kind of a cell are you regenerating, right? So when you have antibodies to your thyroid, why is there a normal reference range from the laboratories? When is it normal to have antibodies to your thyroid? And it's zero to 40 for most labs, somewhere around there. That's normal, why? Because your immune system has to get rid of the old and damaged cells to make room for the new cells. They don't just wither up and go away. Your, and your body makes antibodies to get rid of those old cells, to get rid of those damaged cells, which turns on the genes to make new thyroid cells. So you have a normal level of antibodies to your cerebellum, to your hypothalamus, to your pituitary, to your adrenals, to your muscles. There's a normal reference range from every lab. But when you have elevated antibodies, you're killing off more cells than you're making. By definition, that's an inflammatory cascade killing off cells. You have elevated antibodies to your thyroid, that's gonna give you Hashimoto's or Graves. You have elevated antibodies to your cerebellum, that's why people in their 70s can't dance up and down the stairs. 
It's not because their muscles and their, and their legs can't do it, but the cerebellum in the brain that controls motor movement has been atrophying for 30 years. Because you have elevated antibodies to your cerebellum. 26% of every patient that I check that has elevated antibodies to wheat has elevated antibodies to cerebellum, 26% of them. And how many docs raise their hand that, yeah, they get, uh, um, uh, they have a sensitivity to wheat, and then how many say, yeah, it's affecting my brain? Because they have elevated antibodies. So when you do the test and you see you have elevated antibodies, they say, oh my God, I, I didn't know that. I thought I felt fine. All right, so now I have to d dial down where is this coming from. How do you do that? The subtitle of my book is how you do that. Just one hour a week to the best memory, productivity, and sleep you've ever had. Everybody's too busy to learn a whole new paradigm. We're too busy. But every Tuesday night after dinner, every Sunday morning after services, whenever it is, but every week, you allocate one hour to learn more about this Toxic Substance Control Act, neuro, uh, neurogenesis inhibition because of the chemicals we've got. How do I increase methylation if I have a compromised methylating pathway? How do I rebuild the microbiome to detox all? One hour a week, just one hour a week. And in six months, you've got this, you've got it down. But we're all used to coming to these kinds of conferences and in one hour getting, tell me what to do so I, I can implement it Monday morning. It doesn't work that way with this. And this is what's killing people. This is what's killing our population. This is what's killing the planet, is we're looking for the quick fix to do more tonnage per acre out of our crops, killing the microbiome. We're looking for more tonnage per acre in our muscles and our breasts and you know, in our, you know, we want to be buff and all the uh, Baywatch. That's what we're all looking for. And we're killing ourselves, slowly and surely killing ourselves. There's no happy news here. No, I'm not going to put a nice flavor on this at the end. It's wake up. All of us, wake up. I almost want to cry, you know? People are dying. One out of three will die with dementia in your practice because you focus on making them buff. Or I'm, I don't mean to demean what you're doing, all of us. We're all doing the best we can, but wake up to what the big picture is. I can't say it any other way. Thank you for sounding the alarm. Thank you.